Welcome back, pet parents. I have a very special guest for you today. And, you know, we have been planning this for a little while. But, and I don't even know if, if most of you know this yet, I will probably do a solo episode to kind of update you on it. One of my cats was just uh, diagnosed with, and one of the things that I'm doing for him is adding mushrooms to his food because I know they're very beneficial for cancer. Um, this particular cancer is very painful, metastasizes very quickly. Um, so my plan is just to keep him comfortable. We'll talk all about that in another episode, but incorporating mushrooms into my pet's diet has been really like heavy a really heavy focus for me lately. My dog is getting older and she's not really experiencing a whole lot of like uh, cognitive decline, but I have noticed certain things like she scares a little easier and she's afraid of different things a little easier. So I've been adding mushrooms to her diet as well for cognitive health. And so today's episode, we are talking all about mushrooms. And I think this is a topic that we could probably spend many, 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 many hours talking about, but we're going to try to condense some of the like big pieces of information into this episode. And my guest today is traditionally, he's been an herbalist, more recently gotten into mycology. I will let him tell you all about that. His name is Lee Carroll. And I would imagine if you're in the healthy pet space, you probably know about him. You know who he is. Lee, thank you so much for being here. Would you mind just giving a quick introduction and letting people know who you are and um, kind of how you got here? Sure. It's my pleasure to be here, Jessica, and thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah. I've been uh, in the herbal medicine industry for 35 years now, and I got my start as a production manager at a company called Mediherb back in 1990, and I, I learned to be a herbalist the old-fashioned way by you know, being apprenticed to someone who was the master. And my first 10 years was all about making herbal extracts and making products and learning about what they did. And I, I actually came back and went to, to, uh, to college and got my herbal medicine degree later in life when I was 47. So I'd had, uh, I'd had more than, I had 20 years in, in herbal medicine before I actually went and got formally, um, you know, um, you know, trained. So it's been a long journey and there's been lots of kind of, you know, interesting twists and turns. And I got to live in the US for seven years and to develop the Mediherb business there. And that got me into education. It got me passionate about being a herbalist and much more interested in education, which is where my passion is. And so I had a little business doing uh, consulting to companies and doing education in the US, particularly teaching healthcare professionals how to use herbal medicine in their clinics. And COVID uh, disrupted those plans quite significantly. And it was then I realized that I needed to start doing stuff online. And I started a clubhouse, uh, we called it the Myco Revolution. And it was a place where I was kind of airing all of the new discoveries that I was making about mushrooms. So I had 35 years, I had 30 years and I didn't really learn anything about mushrooms. So the last, the last four years has been a really deep dive and I'm fully, fully uh, converted to the idea that mushrooms being a different kingdom of life, so different kind of programming to the way that plants work, that we need to be including mushrooms as part of our daily routine, both, at, both our, you know, humans and our pets, uh, you know, need these things to have optimal health, you know, across our lifespan. So there's a quick little, little summary. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And one of the things, well, one of the questions I have for you is how, like, what, what got you interested in mushrooms to begin with? Because you had spent so many years as an herbalist. Um, so you've worked with plants for a very, very long time. And as you just said, yeah. mushrooms are like, a to they're a totally different species. And I'm curious as to like, what got you interested? What was that thing that was like, oh, this is really interesting over here. I want to pay attention to this. Yeah. Well, you certainly are influences of the environments that we inhabit, you know, so the, the, the company that we keep, you know, the, the things that we do influence how we think and behave. So 
those those early years in herbal medicine, the, the companies that I worked for didn't really have much of a focus on mushrooms. And if there was a focus, it was just always about cancer wow. and perhaps about immune health. So uh, I started working for a small company called Aduco that had a, we created a brand called Third Planet uh, in early, early 2020, uh, maybe late 29. And I got the opportunity to develop some products for that company. And that's where the mushroom idea came along. So a colleague and a friend, Don Lawson, said, Lee, you know, you don't know that much about mushrooms, but I think it's a it's a really booming, you know, kind of trend at the moment. And I think, you know, with your brain, you know, you really need to get on board with this. And so I started I started researching it and I fell in love. You know, I met Jeff Chilton from Namex uh, and I used the Namex extracts to make those products. And Namex is the parent company of Real Mushrooms. And they're the biggest and I, I believe the best uh, provider of, of mushroom extracts in the, in the. So one of the things that got me really interested in mushrooms, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talking a number of years ago about how mushrooms, like the DNA structure, are much closer to humans than to plants. And yep. that hit me so hard. Like, as you were saying, we're products of our environment. When I heard that, I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I never thought about mushrooms in that way. I just, like, they were outside with all the other plants. Why would I consider yeah, them to it's be more? It's very fascinating. And then I saw um, Fantastic Fungi, or I don't, how do you say it? We all say it differently. Is it? Fun, yeah, fun guy, fun guy. Fungi, fungi. I say fun guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I realized that there's like this network that these, well, plants have their own network. And I, I don't know. One of the questions I have for you, I don't even know if we know this, but maybe we do. Do the um, mushroom, the mushroom network of all of the like, I don't know all the terminology, like the roots and everything that go yeah. under underground, do they also interact with the plant network underground or are they two separate things do we know yeah they're, they're very interconnected and th that movie fantastic fungi did a great job of uh you know getting the large you know the population you know maybe of the whole planet or at least of the western world um you know really switched on to how important fungi are they overcooked the the uh the intimacy of that relationship they had some hypotheses that haven't actually played out in the scientific realm, but definitely uh, plants and fungi have got this really intimate um, relationship in the soil, and they coexist together and su and support each other in terms of you know nutrients and 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 health in in general. So, to, but to answer your earlier question or you know comment about the DNA, there's about 30% of the DNA in a, in a fungus that's similar with a human. And that, that mostly translates into the way that the cells function. So there's, you know, if you, if you break us all down, you know, each of our tissues has got, you know, unique little cells that, that are designed to do their own little jobs. And the functioning of those cells and the messaging compounds and the intracellular structure uh, is quite common or quite similar to a fungi, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we've got similar kind of characteristics. But in terms of the interface between medicine and a fungi, uh, it's a really important um, consideration. And it's a good starting point because we share a common ancestor that goes back about a thousand million years. So that common ancestor produced the fungal lineage. So, you know, the, the kingdom fungi has got fungi or fungus, you know, for, you know, just the singular. And then the, the kingdom um, animalia has got all the animals in it. So in those uh, primordial seas, if you like, fungi needed to eat, fungi needed to feed on animals to, uh, you know, to survive, mostly dead stuff, but they would attack, um, you know, living things as well. So the the competitive interaction animals don't want to be infected by a fungus mm -hmm. so the earliest kind of evidence for 
animal recognition of a fungus goes back about 400 million years. So animals can recognize a fungus because of the, the unique signatures that exist on the surface of the fungus. So if it's a pathogenic fungus, like the sort that causes tinea or, um, you know, um, toenail fungus, for example, or jock itch, um, then the immune system gets um, heightened by those things and it goes into a, a, a defensive response. So when we eat a, an, an edible mushroom, it's got those same signatures, but it doesn't have any pathogenic potential. It's not that type of organism. It, it's, it's, it has a different kind of lifestyle. So when we consume those mushrooms, we get that same kind of um, influence, which tells our immune system, hey, be more vigilant, be more accurate, you know, be more competent, don't be too excited. So that we get that kind of, you know, benefit from that long kind of lineage. But then from the other point of view, because there's similarities, uh, there's nutrients that fungi have that humans need. So humans have got cholesterol, fungal, fungus or fungi have got ergosterol, which is almost the same shape. It's only different by a tiny little bit. You know, your users, unless they're scientists or had science training, wouldn't be able to pick the difference. Um, you know, when I first started doing this, I wouldn't have been able to pick the difference either. So ergosterol plays an important role in human health. And if you ultra, if you expose it to ultraviolet light or the sunlight, it gets turned into vitamin D too. So mushrooms are a significant source of, of vitamin D from that point of view. But mushrooms have also got ergotheanine, which is a, a relatively unknown uh, amino acid derivative antioxidant cytoprotective that humans need to stay healthy and when we don't get it over the course of our life we develop it's associated with the development of all sorts of diseases cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease for example and then there's a whole bunch of other things that are you know a little bit more highly specific but in the whole general scheme of things that idea that we've got this shared ancestor um, you know produces the two kind of streams of healthcare that we get, uh, you know, when we, uh, you know, when we consume them. And because I'm a human herbalist, um, you know, it, all of these ideas translate pretty freely, you know, into, into our pets, particularly dogs, you know, and almost second, you know, like a cat, which has got some unique kind of biology. They certainly do. They certainly do. Well, and you you kind of turned me on to starting to research ergotheanine when we met prior to recording, and I, I did want to talk to you just a little bit about that um, later. But first, I wanted to talk about a few mushrooms. Um, I have some picked out, but then if you have some that, like, no, people really need to know about these, please interject. But yeah. some of the ones that I think are probably more popular for pets at least because this is a pet show right but as you were saying there's so much overlap between what's good for humans and what's what's good for our pets um that i think it's reasonable to to be able to take the da data on these yeah. and say yes for both or no for both right if we're talking i mean i i'm always hesitant to when i when i talk about mushrooms people inevitably freak out about two things one foraging mushrooms on your own which i'm just like no please never do that <laughs> yeah. also psychedelic mushrooms and i'm like no like i don't know enough about that to tell you about that either but certainly for our pets at least right now we're not talking about either one of those these are mushrooms that professionals are growing for you and not what you're foraging on your own that's um, a good point uh, well, and I think I don't I don't remember where I heard this, but I, I heard this very recently, like within the last week, somebody had a story about someone who was very, very familiar. I don't know if they called themselves a mycologist, but they were very, very familiar with mushrooms and uh, understood a lot about mushrooms and how to identify them and still went out and picked mushrooms that made them sick. So like, I feel like there's just so many out there that like, don't do it on your own. Please don't do it on yeah. your own. I, um, I would back you up on that. Yeah. Um, and even I know I will use like the Seek app on my phone because we'll get mushrooms that'll like sprout up in the backyard, and I'm like, thank goodness my dog is not at all interested in even sniffing around these things because I will like snap a picture of them, and Seek will be like, yeah, that's poisonous. Please don't. 
mess with that, right? And like, they just, you know, pop up after like a lot of rain or something. But so probably the most popular mushroom in the pet world is turkey tail. Can you tell me a little bit about turkey tail and why it's so popular for us? Yeah, turkey tail is an amazing mushroom and the it has a lot of roles to play. And every mushroom that's uh, functional or, or edible, they all have got immunological properties. So each each mushroom will have a lot of overlap with what it does in terms of the immune system. And turkey tail is unique because there's a lot of research around the particular polysaccharides, beta-glucans, that are connected to various proteins that are, have been shown in clinical trials to be very effective at supporting patients that have cancer. So the turkey tail um, supports the, the conventional treatments and the patient is more resistant to those conventional treatments so that they can tolerate the conventional medicine and do better. So there's that kind of you know treatment end. But turkey tail on a regular basis uh, has a profound influence on the way that the immune system surveys the environment. And cancer is, is technically a verb. All of us are cancering all the time. And it's our immune system which is designed to seek out and remove those early cells that are aberrant, um, which really needs to be a focal point of long-term health and, and prevention in that category. So turkey tail plays a really important role for engaging the immune system in its ability to detect those aberrant cells at that early stage. And in the modern world, there's, there's many, many influences that overwhelm our cells' ability to, you know, stay healthy. So, you know, all the chemicals and, you know, the, the, the crazy diets that we consume and the stresses and strains that we're under and the electromagnetic radiations, etc. So turkey tail is really good from that point of view. It also has a great facility with uh, improving the way the immune system manages viral infections and managing the way that the immune system deals with cells that have got viruses in them. So many viruses, once they get into our body, they hang around for a long time. So Epstein-Barr, um, for example, lives in white blood cells for your whole life. Um, you know, the herpes yeah. virus lives in the, in the, the, the dorsal root of, of sensory nerves um, for your whole life. So they, ha they create kind of camouflage type signals which mean the immune system um, isn't as able to detect them so i think that uh, the what's going on with turkey tail allows the immune system to be more aware of those cells and people in human studies and because i'm not as up to date with the animal studies so, you know there's there's really good evidence you know for that and then there's turkey tail's got a whole host of what I would call secondary metabolites, so chemistry that you typically can smell or taste, you know, or see as a color, uh, which aren't, and these things get made by fungi and also by plants, and they get made to help protect against the environment where they live. So it helps deal with stress, which might be environmental stress, it might be um, animal grazing it might be repellent to bacteria or it might be repellent to insects and the the secondary metabolites of turkey tail you know play an important role in controlling inflammation and having um, antioxidant functions in the body that keep you know the cellular health of the organism kind of in in tip-top shape and a little bit of turkey tail every day i think as part of a of a supplemental strategy is a really good idea. So there was so much in there, but one thing that um, I really wanted to point out for my pet parents, especially my cat parents, because I, first of all, in the pet world, people tend to go all out for their dogs. Um, yeah. And cats kind of seem to trickle along. I don't, you know, I, I've, theorized on why this is for so long but as somebody who was a cat parent before a dog parent I I tend to think of my cats first which is very odd but I know I have had I 
who my vet told me early on in her life that she did have the herpes virus and she would just regularly get like these flare-ups in her eyes where she would just get gunky almost like conjunctivitis but not yeah and um so traditionally veterinarians have said you know throw in some l-lysine in their food it'll clear up no problem it kind of sounds to me like turkey tail could also do the trick like, turkey tail would be a great option um, in that yeah. scenario. I think the the lysine is a bit overplayed. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I don't think that it's that effective. Yeah. I would have to agree. Um, having like a lifetime with this cat and knowing that it, this was before I got into my holistic phase. Um, so I did everything conventionally, whatever my vet told me to do. And having a lifetime, she lived to be 19. And so... I had a good long time to spend with her and um, learn from her. And that was one of the things that I'm like, I know this is all my vet is telling me to do, but it yeah. doesn't work the way they say yeah. it should work. And from a holistic treatment point of view, that that particular virus gets controlled by the nerves that it, that it lives in. Mm. And when those nerves lose their vitality, the virus can start to replicate and create the e external symptoms. So a big part of the treatment is ensuring that the, the patient um, manages their stress response well and they're not, uh, you know, they're not overdoing it. So in terms of a cat, there might be other supplements that might have a more calming you know, kind, of, kind of influence that could prevent it from getting, you know, it might be anxious about certain things. So it's controlling that, which then leads to less outbreak. So doing the two together. And in the human world, I would, there are some nervous system herbs that, that um, have a antiviral action as well. So I don't know if St. John's wort is suitable for cats, but in a human, it's got that nervous system vitality aspect to it, and it's also antiviral, so it's a kind of combination. So maybe a, a mushroom like cordyceps in that scenario, which supports lung and kidney function, which are you know things that cats need support in, but it's also got some vitality enhancing properties that, and also the immune stuff. So that that's kind of how I think you know in terms of. Yeah supporting a patient like that? So um, cordyceps is on my list be specifically because I think I have it on my list because I do think it is one of the ones that cat people specifically need to be like on the lookout for because of yeah. what you just said. Cats, especially, you know, they live indoors, litter boxes, litter dust. They tend to have a lot of respiratory issues. And then we know that cats have a lot of kidney issues as well, whether it's because of the dry food that they mostly eat or they live like in a chronically, they don't drink water typically outside of their food. So that causes a lot of stress on the urinary system. So cordyceps is one that was on my list specifically for cats. So do you want to jump into that one next? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it a, it's a marvelous mushroom. And the the evidence for it comes from the human world. And, but that, that clinical trial data was developed, you know, in, in rodent studies and, and other animal models. So I don't fully understand how this works with all of the different mushrooms, but the, the chemistry in the mushroom, the beta-glucans, and we say beta-glucans as if it's just one thing, but, you know, it's a very complex group of, of ke chemistry, and there's lots of different kind of options within that domain. and the beta-glucans in, in cordyceps seem to have an affinity for the immunological tissue or cells that reside in the lung uh, and also in the kidney so that the every cell in the body's got resident immune cells and we typically call them you know macrophages but at the linings there's different groups of cells that defend against the external world and I think cordyceps has got some pretty unique affinity for ensuring that the, the immune system within the, the kidney and the lung work properly. I think that's kind of like a foundational aspect to how it works. And then the cordyceps militaris that real mushrooms use has got a molecule in it called cordycepin. 
which gets a lot of attention. And cordycepin has quite a unique role in supporting the way that the kidney works. And this might be a little bit technical, but inside the kidney, there's a thing called a glomerulus, which is like the filtration apparatus. And it's a tight little knot of capillaries or capillaries. So there's, there's blood going through there, and then there's a membrane. And that membrane filters out the urine or filters out the water from the blood. And it's a very intelligent membrane, so it can filter out the right sorts of particles. So you don't want bits and pieces of protein, for example, you know, being lost. So on the inside of that membrane is a cell called a podocyte. And these podocytes line the inside of that membrane. And they, their job is to keep that membrane healthy so that if there's any damage to it, it gets fixed up. If you look at them under an electron microscope, they kind of look like two hands joined together. So if my hand is a cell, they've got these protrusions that overlap and they completely cover the surface. And cordycepin, and I also think some of the beta-glucans and some of the other unique uh, polysaccharide molecules in the, cordyce in, the in the cordyceps look after that particular apparatus in the kidney so that it can function optimally. And there's a few other... Um, herbal substances that play the same kind of role. So curcumin can do it as well. Um, the the rosevins from rhodiola play that role. Uh, the, the triterpenes from Centella asiatica do the same sort of thing. Um, cordyceps is very safe and healthy for a cat. You know, you can, you've got it act, you've got it available in um, you know products, but also there's capsules where you can just you know meter out the dose and mix it through the food and Cordyceps is not kind of like an acute thing. You wouldn't give a whole lot and expect a result, you know, like that afternoon or the next day. But um, at the at the right dose over over you know number of weeks or months, you can see quite significant change take place uh, at at both of those kind of sites. I feel like that's probably true of most natural. Probably true of most things. mushrooms. Yeah, <laughs> most natural things that we do. Um, you know, they take time because, you know, I mean, pharmaceuticals are just so different. Not that they don't have their place, but, uh, you know, when we can use things from nature, um, I do think, as you just said, it's not always like, oh, my pet has a problem now, it's time to start. But like, as a proactive protocol to, to kind of live by and include mushrooms, because we, as it seems, should be eating them anyway. Um, at yeah, least it's human. Yeah. 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 And I can see how for dogs or even cats, you know, they, when they live in the wild, they're going to naturally select things from their environment that they need, that they, their body knows that they need. So even though they may not be, you know, mushrooms may not be a huge part of like their ancestral diet, we can still utilize them because we have the ability now to help our pets thrive and not just survive as, you know, if they yeah, were yeah. Out, outside. Well, there's been a new discovery of a cell type. It's only about 15 years old. They're called neuropod cells and they exist uh, mostly in the, the duo, duodenum. I'm going to say duodenum, which is the Australian way to say it, but duodenum mm. is the American way to say it. And it's the first part of the small intestine. So at least in a human, I'm clear on the, on the anatomy, but it might be a little bit different in a cat or a dog. But cats and dogs still have these same types of cells. And their job is to sense and re really retaste everything that we eat. But they taste it from the point of view of the chemical content of the food. So it's tasting all of the different amino acids, it's tasting all the different sugars, it's tasting all of the uh, fatty acids and uh, other, other types of molecules. So we get, we get hungry and we know we need to go eat something, uh, but those neuropod cells uh, tell us what it is that we've eaten and we might get signals to go back and eat a particular thing. We might get hungry for, oh, I feel like I need more meat or, you know, I, I really feel like I need a bit of fruit. So um, you know, animals have got that kind of intelligence that in the wild, you know, directs them, you know, to, to the sort of stuff that they 
that they really need to like add into their diet beyond what's just been foraged. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, they're so much smarter than we give them credit for, for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So. Yeah, that's a tough one for animals because it's so bitter. Um, Reishi's got the reputation of being the mushroom of immortality, and many people are kind of familiar with that. And in the in the thousands of years, you know, where ago when you know though that mushroom was being you know kind of used, it was it was very rare. It was only for the royalty or very wealthy people. And you know, if farmers found it, they'd take it, you know, to their the leader of their village or to the king or whatever, and they'd they'd get given you know, like a handsome reward. So reishi fits into the category of being longevity enhancing and cancer reducing and all that sort of stuff when you do it on a regular basis. It isn't the sort of thing that you can just take up and a few months later, you know, kind of be, you know, have have whatever you're wanting to treat resolved. So it's a lifestyle thing, just like you can't do all of your exercise for a year just in one month you know you've got to do a bit of exercise every day (laughs) the good diet that we eat can't just be one one week out of the month it's got to be every month of every year so reishi's got these really unique characteristics that enhance the way that the immune system works just like any mushroom does so when you take it on a regular basis your immune system becomes more capable so it's less likely to develop an infection. Um, it's less likely to go wrong. So you're less likely to get an autoimmune disease. Uh, it's more likely to pick up the neoplastic cells when they're really tiny. So you're less likely to get cancer. All of that kind of stuff. And it's got these unique secondary metabolites that people are aware of now. They're called triterpenes um, or triterpenoids. And they're very bitter. and Bitterness in foods typically elicits a danger response because most things that are poisonous are are bitter. So an animal's not likely to want to eat this stuff naturally in the wild. And a human's possibly not likely to eat it as well. So when a baby's young and they're putting everything in their mouth, uh, you know, exploring the world, anything that's bitter comes straight back out. Mm -hmm. And bitterness has got receptors to elicit that kind of bitter taste. And they're not just on the tongue. They exist just about everywhere in the body. So the benefit of reishi is that the molecules that are a significant driver of the benefits and the efficacy are very bitter. And they play these unique roles in the body that haven't yet been fully elucidated. So reishi's key... Uh, kind of benefit is in the cardiovascular system so it helps to make sure that arteries are healthy and you're less likely to get atherosclerosis and it supports the heart and you're less likely to get heart related diseases if you do it regularly across the course of your life and humans and animals have got um, 25 uh, 29 bitter receptors humans have got 25 I don't know how many dogs have got. Cats have got a bit less. And in a human, at least, um, there's 21 of those 25 bitter receptors that are expressed in the arteries and the heart. And the bitter molecules from reishi, no one's ever looked at what they do at those bitter receptors. But the the um, the mouse and the, the rat studies that we've got access to show that the, the, these molecules get into the linings of the blood vessels and they keep the linings of the blood vessels healthy. They prevent the development of disease. And if there is dysfunction there, they can create an environment where it would naturally repair itself. So that's the key kind of treatment that I would, you know, like highlight for reishi. But it's got some nervous system calming properties. Um, it's prebiotic, so it helps the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and it's got those amazing immune things that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Three things. One, nervous system. I need this. This is, I need this. Okay. That's my, my first thought of like, I need, now I need reishi if it's going to help me with my nervous system. Okay. What were those bitter receptors called again? Their technical name is, um, 
TAS2R, so taste receptor number two. So sweet receptors are number one. So TAS2R, um, and then there's they've got numbers. They don't have names, so they're, they're numbered like one through 29. Okay. So first of all, it is so interesting to me that there's so much benefit to us and to animals, and yet it triggers these bitter receptors to tell us to spit it out. I don't, that makes no sense to me, but I understand it's true, but I'm like, why is this happening? And then you probably don't know. Oh, so a number of years ago, I read a book by Dr. Paul Saldino called Carnivore Code. And I actually did the carnivore diet for a little while. I felt amazing when I was on it. Um, but that was one of the things he was talking about are these plant defense chemicals that um, a lot of plant matter, a lot of vegetation have, have, and that is one of, I guess, arguments for an animal-based diet is for humans yeah. is that, you know, these, these plant defense chemicals can upset our digestive system, upset our stomach because we're not supposed to be eating them. Um, so that's super interesting to me. And I'm like wondering why is this not a plant, but a, a, a fungus so beneficial for us, and yet it's triggering bitter receptors to spit it. I don't understand that. Well, I think that the bitter receptors in the mouth get pruned as we age. So they're very, very highly expressed um, in a toddler because they're the most exposed to that danger because they haven't yet developed you know, a palate or they've not been educated to know the difference between things that are poisonous or not. So it's kind of like a, a defense mechanism for them. And it's the responsibility of the parents to educate the children that bitterness is not a, you know, not a problem and it's an essential part of a complete diet. And the modern diet uh, is very focused towards salty and sweet. And the lack of bitterness is a part of the, you know, the, the, the problem that the modern human has in terms of, of what we eat. And some amino acids trigger those bitter receptors. Um, coffee triggers just one bitter receptor. So, you know, the average American, you know, drinks coffee. So you get the benefit of that particular receptor. But Interacting with all of them is really important, and that that's my domain as a herbalist. So those comments you made about that person who wrote the carnivore book, you know, they're comments made by someone that hasn't trained as a specialist in plant medicine, and they take the 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 scary, dangerous kind of you know aspects, and without filtering them through any lens, just tell people to avoid. And lectins are the ones that get kind of picked on, you know, the most in plant food. So lectins are definitely um, a problem, but they're also a benefit. So there's a lot of lectins that have got medicinal properties. And the ones that are unhealthy, when, that, when the food gets cooked, they get destroyed. So plants that have got dangerous, you know, in inverted commas, lectins, um, they're not foods that you would eat raw. You'd cook them so that those those kind of constituents wouldn't have that effect. So it's the same with reishi. It needs to be cooked to be um, efficacious. You've got to boil it in, in water. You've got to extract it with ethanol as well to make sure you get all of the, the triterpenoids out. To avoid the bitter taste, uh, particularly with a, with a dog or a cat, you'd, you wouldn't sprinkle it in the food because it doesn't, it, it's very unpalatable. So it needs to be, you need to put the capsule inside a little piece of meat or my dog's a real sucker for pate. So if, we, if you, we've got to get a pill down, we make our own homemade liver pate with mushrooms in it. So we just coat that around the pill and down it goes without even any chewing. Yeah, I, I cannot remember the name of the man who I think originated the carnivore diet, but he has come out and he's like, as we humans do, take everything to the extreme. Like, this is not what the carnivore diet was originally about you know like we've just kind of taken things to the extreme yeah. so i i totally get that there was a lot of benefit in plants for us and for our pets the other thing i wanted to say 
uh, just because I think my audience will appreciate this, I think I might now understand why few a number of years ago, I did the one chip challenge. Are you familiar with the one chip challenge? No. Okay. So it's like the hottest, hottest hot sauces on earth on a tortilla Oh, chip. I do know that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And it was so horrendous. They change it every year. And I think they might have even stopped doing it because so many people like were being harmed by it. But the one that I got had like charcoal all over it. Like literal, it was black. It was charcoal. But it was so hot. Like I literally like smelling it. I'm, I'm tearing up. And, um, but I think it was the charcoal on it. Like I literally could not swallow it. My body would not let me swallow it. My, my, my throat, my mouth was like, no, you are not going to be able to swallow this chip. And I, I couldn't do it. I had to sit it out. And it wasn't like for lack of trying, I'm like drinking, trying to swallow it. My body would not let me swallow it. So yeah. it probably has something to do with these receptors in my body saying, this is not good for you. you yeah, really well, there's do 100 receptors that receive those capsaicin. They're called TRIP-V is their technical term. And they exist in your gut as well. And if you overactivate activate them too often, uh, you know, it can cause health problems. Hmm. I don't eat spicy food at all. I'm not a spice. I don't like yeah. spice. I just, if somebody challenges me to something, I have to do it. Yeah. So, um, so that was fun. And that is on YouTube if people want to look it up. I cried a lot. So Lion's Mane is also on my list. And this one looks like a brain. And there's a reason for that. Right? Yeah. There's this thing called the doctrine of signatures. It, it, um, when it works, it works, but it doesn't always work. But uh, it definitely looks like a brain, this mushroom. And Lion's mane's got the reputation of being the cognition mushroom, uh, but it's equally good at the immune system like all of the other ones are, and that often gets overlooked. Uh, the traditional use of lion's mane initially was gastrointestinal tract health, so it helps with inflammatory bowel diseases, and it's mm -hmm. very, very significant in that category. So any, any uh, gastrointestinal issues are very well supported by lion's mane and the the whole mushroom is very prebiotic so it's got a lot of prebiotic potential as well it's high in ergotheanine um, not as high as some mushrooms can be and that's a big driver of the cognitive aspects of, of um, lion's mane but it's also got some unique secondary metabolites hericinones are the main ones although there's a like a laundry list of associated molecules and in ways that we don't fully understand, they impact the health of the nervous system to make the nervous system, um, you know, healthier. So in terms of memory formation and um, that, that type of thing, lion's mane helps to improve the synaptic connections and improve the, the health, the internal health of the neurons that drive those processes. So you can see it reflected in improvements in cognitive function. And, you know, some particular um, nervous system diseases that animals get, uh, you know, it, it's been shown to be quite beneficial uh, across, the, across the whole nervous system, not just the brain. Interesting. Okay, so another one I definitely need to take. Sure. Um, okay, chaga. I hear a lot about chaga as well. And that one, these all look funny to me. I'm just going to be honest. Like, mushrooms look funny to me. But chaga yeah, it's looks technically like, not a mushroom. Oh, it's, it's not? A, it's, a, it's a canker. So it's like a disease on the side of a birch tree. And um, there's, a, there's a combination of the fungus and the tree. And the, the fungus transforms the, the sap from the birch tree. So um, chaga can only come from a living birch tree. You can't grow it on brown rice or sawdust or a dead log. It's got to come from a living tree. And it creates these unique uh, compounds which make chaga, um, you know, in that same category as reishi where there's quite a high, and turkitel, where there's quite a high amount of secondary metabolites that are quite unique. And birch trees are medicinal in their own right and birch tree extracts are quite immunologically active. So chaga's, you know, kind of like a hybrid between, you know, mushroom and the chemistry from the tree. So it's got um, unique properties for the immune system and it 
does you know similar things to what we've been talking about earlier very much similar to what we talked about so prevention of cancer uh, you know those cells from becoming you know like more of a problem and um, having antiviral effects it's got a reputation for being very suitable for skin based conditions so just like the 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 cordyceps has got affinity for the lung and the kidney the chaga's got an affinity for the gastrointestinal tract and the gastrointestinal uh, skin axis. So it's very beneficial um, in skin-based conditions. That and is you can really... even use it topically on skin conditions, um, not just orally. Oh, really? That is so interesting to me because most of my clients, most of the dogs that I work with have severe leaky gut, which leads to food sensitivities which leads to skin issues, you know, the whole... Yeah, and that's a, it's a common theme, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think lion's mane's probably underrated in that leaky gut category and also tremella um, in the leaky gut category. Really? So, okay, is tremella also the one that wasn't on my list, but I, you, said, you said it, and I'm thinking, is that the one that Joni told me is like the fountain of, like Botox in a mushroom? Yeah, kind of. That's a good way to describe it. So it's it's a it was a food originally, and uh, it was kind of like the fountain of of youthful appearance. And the the legend has it that Yang Fui, I think the 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 king's consort was the most beautiful woman in the world, and she was a, an avid consumer of tremella, and the tremella made her even more beautiful. And she was so beautiful that the king was completely besotted and totally distracted and didn't look after his kingly duties. So uh, the, the, the kingdom became ruinous. And so the king's consort was, was executed for the crime of distracting the king. So there's kind of like this legend around its, its ability to create beauty. And it improves, when you take it orally, it improves skin quality. When you apply it topically, it's got emollient uh, properties which make the skin more supple um, and, and more lustrous. So it, it's got an affinity for the immune cells in the skin. So when you take it on a regular basis, it improves the functionality of the, the tissues within the skin to make them more uh, effective at, at just maintaining healthy skin. And it's quite tasty. It's a neutral tasting thing, and it's often served as a, a sweet kind of dessert but it equally goes well you know in human foods in savory foods and you could mix it in it's it looks a bit like a noodle i think that's where the original noodle idea came from but it's a clear um rosette uh, of noodle kind of wavy noodle shape so when you when you've got it on your plate you know and you pick a piece up it just looks like a flat rice noodle and you could mix it into a dog's food as a as an extract, and they wouldn't even notice the taste. They'd just you know lap it up. Interesting. Well, now that I'm fairly certain, unless you know, the whole world crumbles as it may, probably wouldn't be executed. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Tremella as well. <laughs> You'll have a okay. long list at the end of the podcast. I will have a very long list at the end. Okay, so we talked about that and that. We have not talked about artist con. We haven't talked about that one yet. Um, that doesn't. That looks. That's also very. I would have a hard time say, to, looking at Reishi and artist con and being like, I don't know which one is which. Yeah, is that, I'm not familiar with the species name for artist con. Is it a local Reishi? Ganoderma. G- Aplanatum? Yeah. So I think it's, there's lots of different uh, species in the reishi genus. And Um, I think they've all got quite overlapping properties, but there's probably nuances to each one that make them, uh, you know, valuable. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. How about, well, this one, a lot of us can get like at our grocery store sometimes, shiitake. So shiitake is arguably the most famous uh, of the edible and medicinal or functional mushrooms. And it's fallen out of favor as a functional mushroom because people get distracted by the shiny objects and the new things, I think. Uh, 
because it's seen as a food, it doesn't get the same functional um, recognition that it deserves. So shiitake, if you were to just pick one mushroom as a human, that would be a really good choice to have for the rest of your life. As a, eating it as a food on a regular basis or taking it as a supplement on a regular basis. And there's really good evidence for the profound benefits that you get from, from the immune system. And it's got a lot of nutrients. It's very high in amino acids. So it, it delivers a lot of amino acids. It's high in ergotheanine. It's got a whole bunch of unique chemistry that support uh, healthy lipid metabolism in the body. And it's a really tasty mushroom. It's delicious to consume. So it's one that I do on a regular basis. But companies often don't sell just a straight shiitake so real mushrooms have got shiitake in the five defenders which is the the blend of mushrooms which is focused on kind of whole immune health it's got the ones that we've talked about it's got turkey tail and chaga reishi uh, maitake um, and the shiitake so but it won't replace tremella right well if I was on the proverbial desert island and it was a choice between shiitake and tremella I'd take the shiitake yeah, but that's because there's nobody else there to look at you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, okay. um, I, I do tremella every day myself. Um, I, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so what are some of your favorite mushrooms that somebody like me may not have on my radar? Well, the ones that we've all talked about are my favorites, and I, I do all of those every day. The thing that we haven't talked about is ergotheanine, which is the like the 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 important hidden constituent in every mushroom, but dominant in certain mushrooms like oyster mushroom, particularly the golden oyster. And ergotheanine is an antioxidant, like vitamin C is. And ergotheanine doesn't quite meet the definition of a vitamin it falls short by just a tiny little whisker. So animals and humans have got uh, all of the attributes for ergotheanine that would make it a vitamin. We have transporters that are dedicated to that molecule that bring it into the body. We've got transporters in all of our cells to move it around. Uh, we avidly hang on to it. We don't let any go. The physiology and the biochemistry of humans and animals and our you know dogs and cats uh, is engineered to rely on ergotheanine as part of the antioxidant team which keep all of our cells healthy and ergotheanine's primary role is when cells become stressed and the, the, the burden of stress becomes a little bit too much ergotheanine gets engaged and it protects those cells while the, the other members of the team, which are suffering because of the high stress, they get uh, like topped up and replenished. So it's a challenging thing to describe, um, you know, at that kind of pointy end of the detail. But we don't know about ergotheanine because it's a recent discovery. It was found in the early 1900s, but the relevance of it to human health uh, is only about 20 years old when those transporter proteins were discovered. And then scientists started looking and found ergotheanine everywhere in the body. So it's very high in red blood cells. So red blood cells are, are a site of high oxidative stress because of all of the hemoglobin. There's like 250 million hemoglobin molecules in a red blood cell. And they're harvesting oxygen and oxygen reacts violently with iron. So the the benefit of, of the oxygen iron thing is that we can transport it around in the body. But the, the, the negative is that you can create all of this reactive oxygen and you can cause damage. So ergotheanine's high there because it's really effective at dealing with that unique particular type of stress. Um, the eyes are very exposed to UV rays and oxygen. So ergotheanine is very highly expressed in eye tissue as a natural defense against the stress there. The liver and the blood vessels are sites of very high stress. Every time you eat a meal or eat something, those nutrients pile into your bloodstream and you get a glycemic spike. And that, that causes stress in the linings of the blood vessels. 
And if we overeat or if we, you know, we're eating the wrong things, there can be stress in the liver. So ergotheanine is very highly expressed in those tissues as well. And as we age, it declines. And this is a supplement which is, you know, good for the pet parents as well as the pets. As we age, we, we lack ergotheanine and it's, it's the most highly correlated nutrient which, which is low when involved in cardiovascular disease and all of the neurodegenerative diseases. So Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, frailty, um, some gastrointestinal diseases, uh, preeclampsia in, in pregnant women. Uh, so ergotheanine, when you look at the metabolomics, um, it has the highest ranking for being the most associated with the development of the, those diseases. It's a curious thing that no one knows about it. Yeah, well, yeah, I hadn't heard about it until you mentioned it when we spoke um, a little bit ago. What is, okay, when I did try to do some research on it, I found different things. But one of the things that I wasn't sure if it was true or not, maybe you can clear it up for me, is it an essential amino acid? Can we, do we make it or do we have to get it from food? We don't make it, no. Okay. So we, we need to get it from food. And the primary source of food is a, is a mushroom. And I think that from a human point of view, we under, underestimate how much fungi our early human ancestors ate. And mm. this ergotheanine really highlights that. Plants get well, it. So going back to your very fungi. earliest comments in the podcast, plants get it from the fungi in the soil. So when humans eat plants, they get a tiny bit of ergotheanine. It's, it's about a hundred times less than a fungus or a, or a, a functional mushroom. Mushroom is the primary source. The human body and the the dog body and the cat body, you know, or it might be your horse or your cow, or whatever your pet is. Uh, we wouldn't have these transporter proteins that are unique just for that particular molecule if our physiology didn't need it. Like we, the you know, biology wouldn't put them there if we didn't need them. And they're not just in our gastrointestinal tract, but they're expressed everywhere in our body. And the way that our body controls the movement of these things, so if we've got high levels of stress, the genetics in the cell that's being stressed will upregulate the transporters to bring more in to protect the cell. There's a lot of intelligence around the body's need for this stuff. And it's, a, it's one of the primary things um, that's just been discovered that keep mitochondria healthy. So mitochondria are the driving force of the energy production um, in every cell and the total organism. And ergotheanin gets into mitochondria and it, in, it increases their ability to do respiration. So you can get more energy when you've got, when you've got um, ergotheanin present. And ergotheanin also helps to control the oxidative stress within mitochondria to mean that the environment is healthy. There's lots and lots of really curious things. There, a lot of them are really kind of hard to explain, um, you know, to a, a non-scientific audience. It's yeah, I bet. So, okay, two things. One is so gross. I'm gonna I'm gonna warn people right now. This is so gross, but it I'm is warned. what it is. And so I'm I'm currently in another nutrition certification program with. Dr. Ian Billinghurst, who's the father of raw feeding for dogs and cats. And one of the things that he talks about ad nauseum to the point where I'm like, I can't handle this anymore, is how much feces dogs, wolves and dogs, as, the, as we were creating dogs from wolves, how much feces they ate. And he talks about it so much that I am so grossed out, but I'm trying to push through <laughs> and, and you were talking about how we underestimate how much fungi that our ancestors ate and the re the the connection that i'm making is with how much fungi our ancestors ate coupled with the fact that feces was a huge part of the ancestral dog's diet that this is probably where they were getting a lot of the mushroom benefit from in their diet. Yeah, you know, 
I'm not an expert in that area, but eating eating feces makes sense from the point of view of optimizing the microbiome and getting access to any of the food nutrients that haven't been completely digested. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, it's quite you know common to see little bits of bone, for example, you know, like in feces. So there's probably a second meal in there if you want to get yes. grossed out even more. Oh no, yeah. Well, they so the the official term is coprophagic coprophagic i think is how you say it yeah, cool. for for dogs and i like a lot of animals are like this i think if we look in the animal kingdom humans are probably some of the only animals to, that don't don't do this yeah <laughs> um but the other thing that i was thinking and i being in australia i'm not sure if you're familiar familiar with this product but there's a new brand new product on the market that has never been made before um, from a company called Green Juju. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. But they are doing, they call it a mushroom probiotic. And what it is is a brine. So they're basically soaking mushrooms and creating this brine. And it's being marketed for the probiotic benefit in the product. But one of the things that they've been talking a lot about lately is how many pet parents have been coming to them saying, that their dog's hair stains have been completely going away by using this product. And that came to mind when you were talking about the ergotheanine and how it affects, it, it basically is helping the liver. So in traditional Chinese medicine, the eyes are the window to the liver. And so I kind of made that connection. I don't know if it's true or not. We would have to study it, but I'm like that's where my brain went when you were talking about the benefit to the to the liver with ergo. Yeah, well, that would make sense. Yeah, and it also makes sense of why animals, you know, would be very focused on eating the liver um, and consuming blood. You know, there's lots of human mm -hmm. cultures that ate blood. Um, so, mm -hmm. blood and liver, you know, they've got their obvious kind of benefits. You know, iron in the blood, and and you know, in the liver, there's there's you know all of that good stuff but ergotheanine is very very high in those as well and that's kind of like a, a new discovery so because our animals you know may not be getting you know those you know like native diets particularly with a cat you know that's no longer you know like eating whole animals mm -hmm. then real mushrooms has got an oyster mushroom product uh, called ergo plus and golden oyster is a is a very high producer of ergotheanine, which makes it really easy for uh, you know the pet parent to give it to their animal. So the pet parent takes one capsule a day, and the the dog or the cat you know get their their body weight kind of dosage as well to ensure that things are functioning optimally throughout life. And you don't notice changes early on, uh, but as you get older, it's a significant preventer. We don't yet have a a test for ergotheanine, so it's about a year or two away. Once we've got a diagnostic test, ergotheanine will be predictive of dementias. Um, it might even be predictive of cardiovascular disease, but definitely, um, you know, all of the different dementias. And the, the epidemiology data in humans matches up, you know, really nicely. So I think it'll be the same with, with animals as well. If you get below a threshold, your risk for particular diseases will... So, okay, forgive me, because I'm trying to make connections, and I'm not as smart as you. <laughs> um, you mentioned dementia, and were you talking about ergotheanine when you were talking about lipids and being able to better process lipids, or were you talking about something else? Uh, something else, yeah. So I think we were talking about um, shiitake, uh, okay. And there's a few mushrooms that have got ergosterol and other, other molecules that improve healthy lipids. Um, but er ergotheanine's not typically, you know, I wouldn't put it in that lipid kind of category. It's okay. more whole cell health, so whole body health. Okay. Okay. Because I know with, and I don't know how it happened in Australia. I know in the U.S., try, you know, in the, I think it was in the 70s, we um, kind of demonized animal products, saturated fats, trying yeah. to get people over to seed oils, which was very, very successful. And that's exactly when we started seeing all these 
huge increases dementia alzheimer alzheimer's brain related like issues yeah. cognitive issues and i know our you know our brains are made up of so much saturated fat so i was trying to make a connection but there wasn't a connection there to yeah, be made well, the stuff. connection there is that ergotheanine plays a role at the moment we understand it as an antioxidant in the brain so it it facilitates because those processes that you're alluding to the development of, of alzheimer's disease let's say it's it's inflammation so the cells have got too much stress they can't cope with that stress and that stress causes the aberrant representation of amyloid beta and tau proteins which kind of cause the disease so if you didn't have the stress and the inflammation in the first place you wouldn't end up with the disease so mm -hmm. ergotheanine is not a cure at the end stage um, it's a prevention at the beginning and in the early stages and mid stages it can help in the reversal process um, so, along with other with other things which which are necessary so it, it plays that important role but there are emerging uh, studies that suggest that ergotheanine um, has other roles to play beyond just being an antioxidant. So it helps improve um, the receptors that control the the um, the health of the hippocampus. So that's where it plays a role in memory. It's it improves the signal. So lion's mane's got a cognitive, you know, kind of focus, and the body makes neurotrophin hormones and cats and dogs do this as well. So it makes BDNF, which is quite famous, nerve growth factor, neurotrophin 3, 4. These are endogenous molecules that get produced, which get received by receptors at the neuronal tissue. And the message that gets delivered are messages of housekeeping and improvement. So there's not enough synapses. You need to improve more synapses. You know, you're transmission rate of the message is a little bit slow so you've got to speed it up there's so that's this general kind of housekeeping messaging and that receptor uh, one of them is called track b which is quite famous because it's the one that psilocybin interacts with so a lot of people have heard of it so the track b receptor gets improved in the way that it can be a transmission of the message under the influence of ergotheanine so ergotheanine is not just an antioxidant. It's doing these other things that we don't currently understand how they do it, but it, we know that it does it. Interesting. Interesting. So more than anything, well, mushrooms should be a part of our everyday life yeah. and our pet's everyday life. The, these are not like something acute is happening. The, like this is throughout our life. They should be a very big part of, I'm very, I'm very, very, very much into food therapy. I like to feed whole, real foods as much and as often as possible. I know that's not always possible, especially with our animals. Um, they can be trickier to feed various things too. One tip that I don't remember who said this. I don't remember if it was Amy Renz or Dr. Linda Loudon, but recently she said that to chop, like finely chop up mushrooms, whatever it may be, a shiitake, or if you can get your hands on a, a, a cordyceps or whatever you're, you're able to get your hands on. Yeah. And if you cook it in um, clarified butter or ghee, that it tends to be very palatable for cats. Um, Cause I know we have a harder time getting things into our cats and our dogs, but still some dogs, we have a hard time getting that. So I just wanted to mention that to people because it was the first time I had ever heard somebody say that and I wanted to put it out there for everyone else to hear. So I am a big, big fan of feeding real food, but I know sometimes we have to supplement these things as well, yeah. especially with well, the amount. And I'm a, I, I'm, I agree with you. The problem for most people is that it's very hard to be consistent with that approach. And mm -hmm. it's impossible to get access to some of the mushrooms in that fresh form that yeah. are needed, you know, for the particular animal. So when you think about a supplement, uh, when like with real mushrooms, they've done the cooking for you. And in if you're buying just the pure mushroom extracts, it's a pre-cooked extract, which is much more efficacious than you could 
kind of make it home. And the finely gr ground nature of the powder means that the you know the animal gets access to all of the constituents. When you when you don't chew a mushroom, and a, a cat's not going to be chewing its meal 35 times before it swallows, mm -hmm. you know, like the average human should be doing but doesn't. So you, if you swallow whole chunks of mushroom, the digestive tracts aren't capable of digesting it fully. So unlike a piece, you can swallow a piece of meat, and we've got en the cat or the dog has got enzymes to break that meat down and extract all of the goodies but they don't have the enzymes to break down the, the cell walls of the fungi and break down the pieces of, of fungi which are made up of mycelium. So the more finely ground the mushroom is, uh, the, the more bioavailable and accessible all of the nutrients are. That idea that you just quoted, you could cook the mushrooms in clarified butter and then grind them up to make them even more um, beneficial. Having, a, having access to a whole mushroom that's got nothing else mm -hmm. in it, just as a pure supplement, means that you don't have to be worried about missing days or weeks because you don't have access to the mushroom. Yeah, that's a very good point too. So many of these, we, I wouldn't even know where to get them. And then um, seasonally, I have no idea. I don't know. There's, yeah, there's so many like sourcing. Challenge. Yeah, there's so many sourcing issues. So I think, I think I've probably taken up more than enough of your time. I appreciate it. There were so many wonderful things in here. I appreciate you kind of breaking down like why we're looking at these individual mushrooms and, and why they're so important and why we believe they're so beneficial to us um, and kind of the science behind it and also understanding that there's still so much we don't know. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's but, an evolving field for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again for being here. My, it was my such pleasure. a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, it was such a pleasure having you and um, talking to you about this. I think mushrooms are so fascinating for so many, so many reasons. They're probably so much smarter than us and we just play. They are them very intelligent. Them. Sure. Yeah. Yes. As far as like, especially survival, my goodness. Like, anyway, that's, that. those are the kind of 3 a.m. thoughts I have. So Thank you again for yeah, being my here. My pleasure. I've had a great time. I've, and I hope your audience has learned some things about, about uh, functional mushrooms and their pet's health. Yes. Really quick, before you go, I know you have, what is your website? Because you also have an online course that people can take to learn more about mushrooms, right? Yeah. So Lee at realmushrooms.com is my email address and realmushrooms.com, you know, is the, the website to get access to all of that information. For healthcare professionals, I run a, a, a course. That's my website, herbameditari.com. That's a bit of a mouthful. I'm going to change it to Lee Carroll Herbalist to make it easier for people. But oh, I, have yeah. a, I have a course called uh, Mastering Medicinal Mushrooms 1. It's called The Foundation. And it's a 14-hour course that's got videos and white papers and monographs that teach a healthcare professional or a pet coach, uh, you know, the basics of, of mushrooms, all the chemistry, you know, why they're relevant and, you know, how to use them in clinic so that I could uh, tackle a broad audience. I traffic lighted the information. So anything that was essential, I highlighted with a red color, anything that was um, recommended, I highlighted with a with a yellow or an amber color, and anything that was optional or nerdy, I highlighted green. So you could read your way through the program and just follow the green track and just do all of the essentials, or you could, you know, you could put your reading glasses on, do all the nerdy stuff, and that would take a bit longer. So for for people gotcha. that have got different levels of interest or you know scientific understanding, there's that different paths they can take. So. Herba is H-E-R-B-A, and then Meditari is M-E-D-I-T-A-R-I. So Meditari as in meditate or to ponder. And Herba is Latin for plants, and back then it also included mushrooms. Gotcha. So HerbaMeditari.com. Awesome. Well, and that will be on the website, in uh, the show notes on the website, um, so people can just click the link and go there as well. Again, thank you so much. I think my pleasure, um, Jessica. It's been great. I've had a I've had a wonderful time. You've asked a lot of really good questions. Oh, 
thank you. One of one of my good friends says that mushrooms will save the world, and I I kind of like every day I'm believing that a little bit more. Yeah, so. I think they will play a big role. Awesome. Well, um, guys, if you I think this is an episode for you to re-listen to. Make some notes. Reach out on social media if you have questions. And um, thank you again, Lee. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your rest of your winter in yeah, Australia, yeah. where it yeah. is summer here. <laughs> yeah, it's freezing here this morning. Yeah. All right. See you Thanks. guys. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye-bye. See you next time.